Live from New York City, it's the Gary Null Show. And now, your host, Gary Null. I was born in a little rock. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Null. Today, we're going to talk about what is the difference between soy lecithin and sunflower lecithin? That's one of the questions from one of the attendants, attendees in the uh, premiere this week. Also, uh, a person's asking, I live in Dayton, Ohio, and are there any holistic doctors here? So I'll answer that. And then this morning, working out in the gym early, the television was on, and they had an ad for, uh, it was for an Alzheimer's commercial. And in it, they showed pictures of older people and said, Someone out there is going to be the person who we're going to cure Alzheimer's. I hope so, for their benefit, the person suffering. But then let's pull back a bit and go back to something I suggested at the beginning of the week. And that is that we can only accept one truth at a time, one, one dominant energy in our lives at a time. Everything else is simply... It is collapsed into, well, maybe in time I'll get to it, or maybe I might be open to it. So here we have someone, we have several people that we have improved or reversed their Alzheimer's, as we have improved and cured AIDS, as we have improved and reversed and cured breast cancer and Parkinson's. And we, you've, we've had these people on the program. You've heard them, real people, not anecdotal, not made up. We've had our doors open to the medical community for 45 years to come and see, sit there, retreats. We had seven doctors, board-certified doctors, at the last retreat. They were not into holistic health, but they were curious. And I, I commend them for their curiosity. I commend them for being open enough to at least see what might be able to challenge the dominant truth that they've been living by. Is it a universal truth? If it were, then it wouldn't just be a pharmaceutical drug approach to disease. It would be prevention. It would be body, mind, spiritual involved. So today, I'm going to give you a classroom on the air about Alzheimer's and how I go about helping people who then are able to return to a normal life. Now, I'm sure that someone in this audience could share this program, my Alzheimer's segment, with the Alzheimer Foundation. Try to get it into someone's specific and personal hands. And then follow up to say, did you listen to what Gary had to say? Did you, did you contact his office? Did you ask to speak with the people that he's worked with? Because I have people that you can call. In fact, thousands of people in this audience have called him and say, hey, I heard you on Gary's show and, and you had at end stage multiple sclerosis, and you reversed it. Yeah, Kenny says, and, and here's how I did it. Or Alzheimer's, here's how I did it. Or Parkinson's, here's how I did it. Or cancer, here's how. Or AIDS, we, we, the entire African-American community that watched Tony Brown's journal or read the Amsterdam News or was out there into the, at least the New York area, they knew it. Well, why isn't this universally uh, being researched? Because it would threaten the profits, the politics, the control that selective individuals, corporations have over the medical paradigm. And that's the richest paradigm in the world. How rich? Today I'm going to give you some insights on that as well. $3.3 trillion they're making this year, this year. Or put it another way, that's five times what the military industrial complex spends. And that's egregious. Well, our medical industrial complex is even more egregious and kills more people. So we're going to explore all this. Plus today, time permitting, one of the men I have a lot of respect for, John Pilger. He is going to talk about Venezuela and Trump and the Russians. And then you'll hear from Julian Assange, a short little uh, discussion where he will prove that the Russians did not leak anything to him in the way of documents. And then I'm going to continue, as I promised I would, anywhere where we have engaged in regime change 
and have been propagandized and poisoned with uh, false and fake media about why we were justified in destroying whole nations, prosperous nations, peaceful nations like Libya. Today it's Syria. And I'm going to have one of the few honest reporters, Eva Bartlett, explain what's really going on in Syria. Oh, and by the way, hundreds of thousands of Syrians are going back to Syria because now at least 60% of Syria is no longer in the control of ISIS or al-Nusra or al-Qaeda. And the Syrian people are rebuilding. Well, if you feared a so-called dictator and repressive regime, you wouldn't go back. But if you've actually gone to Syria on your own, gone to, gone to the main cities and talk with them about what do they think of the government, what do they think of Assad, what do they know happened based upon being there and in the, on the ground? A whole different story than anyone's willing to talk about in the American media. We'll talk about it. We're going to continue to bear truth to lies, including lies from the left, lies from even programs on Pacifica, which is unfortunate. But nonetheless, we will deal with it. So, and we're going to talk about energy-dense foods can increase your risk of cancer regardless of how overweight you are in the University of Arizona. And we're going to talk about, from The Guardian, from Oliver Millman, the meat industry is causing one of the largest, if not the largest, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. You might mention, um, remember I talked about many times going down to the Gulf, going down to New Orleans. And from there you can take a boat out and you suddenly see all this very turgid water of the Mississippi. And then you see this dead zone. I mean, it's just, it's like a, someone drew a line in the sand and you go from one type of water to a dead water. And why is it dead? And how big is it? The last time I visited, it was the size of the state of New Jersey. It's growing tremendously. Why? Well, I'll explain that. I'm going to go, being going back down to New Orleans, I'm going to be doing some filming down there again. I'm going back down in the Lower Ninth Ward. And so for anyone who lives down in New Orleans, who wants to come see how I do a documentary and join me on a day of shooting. Uh, as long as you stay all the shot and just kind of watch, I don't mind you being on the set and, and I'll be announcing the dates I'm going to be down in New Orleans, going out on the Mississippi and then going up the river and talking with some of the farmers about uh, the consequences they're using phosphorus-based, nitrogen-based fertilizers that's contributing to this problem. It'll be an interesting three or four days. Let's begin. First up, this is from John, who attended the premiere this week. Gary, what's the difference between soy lecithin and sunflowers? Well, soy lecithin comes from the soybean. And if it's some non-genetically engineered soybeans, organic soybeans, it's terrific. Why? Because lecithin is a very important contributor to the balance of fatty acids in our body. It also, in its protein form, is twice as high, three times as high in protein as any other beans, like kidney beans, fava beans. And um, it generally contains upwards of 27 grams of protein per can, which is a little over a cup. Well, that's right up there with meat. So it's one of the reasons that people who have used soy supplementing in their diet uh, have not had to have any animal proteins. Sunflowers, on the other hand, have an extraordinarily rich butter that you make from it. You simply take the sunflower seeds and they're pulverized. You put them in a blender. And then the oils of that are what are liberated and the oils of the sunflower seed, either chewing them or making them into a sunflower butter, uh, you just take a teaspoon of that and you can put it into your smoothie or into a hot cereal, just eat it. Uh, and it's delicious. Now it can also provide a source of lecithin. They dry it and then they, they process out the oils in a particular way and you get a sun, uh, so, sunflower lecithin. So you can get a soy lesson or a sunflower lesson. They're both good. They both work. I would not say one is better than the other. 
<clears throat> then we have, this is from Janice. Uh, Gary, uh, you talked about, at the end of your film, you had film credits, names of physicians. I'd like to take to Dayton, Ohio in September. Okay, you're welcome to take the film. You received a copy of it. Uh, and I'm more than happy to have people put it on their local television stations, on public access, or show it in a school. School teachers were in the audience. There were, there were medical doctors, professors. About 80% of my audience is African American. And they come from all walks of life. So the whole idea of giving you a gift is for you to give that gift. So the more people we can show that film to, the more likely we are to influence people about why it's good to shift from a meat to a plant-based diet, helping the environment and helping people's health. And so let's get it into schools. Let's start showing it. Now here's what any of you, mind you, we're heard all over the world. So how do you get into the hands of a good holistic physician? It's relatively simple. Go up and Google holistic physician. Now, holistic can be spelled H-O-L or W-H-O-L, both ways. Or you can go up in ACAM, American Academy, A Academy of Medical, uh, uh, no, what, what is it, ACAM? Let me think, it's been a long time since I've been there. That would be American Academy of Alternative Medicine. And they have physicians all over the country. How many? I don't know. But you can Google it, and you'll get the different lists, and then you find one closest to you. Same way with a holistic dentist. There are about five or 600 holistic dentists in the United States. And again, you could just Google holistic dentist, and then your location, and it would give you the person closest to you. Same way with mixed chiropractors versus straight. Straight, they just do the Beneficial subluxation, meaning they put your body back and your spine back into alliance, uh, uh, balance, and, and the same with your hips. But a holistic one would also be able to offer nutrition advice and, and uh, just like a natural path if they graduate from the accredited schools like Bastyr College and National College. These are very good schools, and naturopathic physicians are extremely important. They serve a major function in our society. So... Google it, and you get the whole list. <clears throat> Next up, this is a report from The Guardian from Oliver, Oliver Millman. Let me tell you what it says. It says, the global meat industry, already implicated in driving global warming and deforestation, has now been blamed for fueling what is expected to be the worst dead zone on record in the Gulf of Mexico. Toxins from manure and fertilizer pouring into waterways are ex exacerbating huge, harmful algae blooms that create oxygen-deprived stretches of the Gulf and the Great Lakes and the Chesapeake Bay. According to a new report by MITEI, the environmental group chaired by former Congressman Henry Waxman, it is expected that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, will this week announce the largest ever recorded dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. It's expected to be larger than nearly 8,200-square-mile area that was forecast for July, the expanse of water roughly the size of New Jersey. Nutrients flowing into the streams and rivers and ocean from agriculture and wastewater stimulate an overgrowth of algae, which then decomposes. This results in hypoxia, or lack of oxygen, in the water, causing marine life either to flee because they can't breathe, or to die. Some creatures, such as shrimp, suffer stunted growth. Algae blooms themselves can cause problems, as in Florida last summer, when several beaches were closed after they became coated in foul-smelling green slime. America's vast appetite for meat is driving much of this harmful pollution, and which is being blamed on the small number of businesses for practices that are, quote, contaminating our water and destroying our landscape in the heart of the country. Quote, this problem is worsening and worsening, and regulation isn't reducing the scope of this pollution. These companies' practice need to be far more sustainable. So it goes on to talk about this. And one of the biggest polluters is Arkansas-based Tyson Foods. 
is identified by the report as a dominant influence in the pollution due to its market strength in chicken, beef, and pork. Tyson, which supplies the likes of McDonald's and Walmart, slaughters 35 million chickens and 125,000 head of cattle every week, requiring 5 million acres of corn a year to feed, for feed. And this consumption resulted in Tyson generating 55 million tons of manure last year. And a lot of that ends up in the water. This pollution also has been linked to drinking water contamination. Last week, a report by the Environmental Working Group found that water systems serving 7 million Americans in 48 states contained high levels of nitrates. Consuming nitrates has been linked to an increased risk of contracting certain cancers. Quote, large parts of America are being plowed up for corn and soy to raise meat. This is very, there's very little regulations, so we can't wait for that. The corporate agriculture sector has shown it is responsive to consumer concerns about meat production, so we hope that the largest meat companies will meet expectations. Well, good luck with that. Two things to learn from this report. One, that the companies are merely there to supply people with what they crave. They crave meat products, pork, chicken, fish, beef, lamb, and veal, and as long as they continue to have a demand, they will supply it. So there there is a a co-responsibility. The farmers who grow exclusively with pesticides and genetically engineered corn and soy to get the animals their feed, but the animals are very poor at converting the feed into meat. It takes 20 seven pounds, upwards from 17 to 27 pounds, depending upon what you're feeding, of, of these high-quality grains to make one pound of meat on, on, on the hoof. And that makes no sense whatsoever. That's 27 to 1. Even if you took the conservative figure 17 to 1, it makes no sense. That's like saying, well, the meat in one hamburger, one single hamburger, is 30,200 gallons. The water necessary to to create that, the the feed the cattle, the water to create a a pound potato, organic potato, is is 90 gallons. So 90 gallons versus 3,000 gallons? One is healthy, the other is disease-producing? So we, we are conditioned from early on to crave these foods. So the Industries that are selling us the food are responsible. The media that allows itself to be compromised on all kinds of principles is responsible. For example, the largest group of people wanting organic food and going vegan are millennials. But how many of those same millennials that they themselves are vegan and make sure that their children do not have the soft drinks or the high sugar or high meat diets, they try to feed them healthy, good for them, then go right down and work in corporations on Wall Street or in banks or in these big companies like Tyson, and there's a disconnect. They don't see that what they would select personally may be what they should select as a universal standard of truth. If your child deserves to have purity in food, why shouldn't every child deserve to have purity in food? If you would not eat something because you know its health consequences, why should you then try to use your advertising uh, brilliance to convince people on through your medium, whether it's a magazine ad or television or radio commercial or billboard, you should buy this product, even knowing that that product can cause disease. So we have to put those in there. We we have to blame the entire medical establishment. They're they're guilty as hell. Every nurse, every doctor, they're all guilty as hell, and they cannot shrug this off. Oh, they can, then they will. They take no responsibility for anything in life. If they did, they wouldn't be practicing because they've come up with so many failures and dead bodies and injured and maimed people. But that's a separate issue. The idea is you're smart enough, you're educated enough, you're capable of research enough to know that virtually everything that goes in that patient's body will either produce health or disease. If you were living in the North, you were in a bad job, you were in a bad relationship, uh, and you got a flu shot, and you got out of that relationship, you got out of that job, you took a break, you went to Florida, you relaxed, you went to the beach, you had fun, and you didn't get the flu, 
none of that would be credited. The flu shot would. Now, that's not just bad science. That's completely, a totally, 100% corrupt science. And that's what we live with. We live with corrupt science, corrupt news, corrupt politicians, corrupt institutions, corrupt religious institutions, corrupt educational curricula. Everything is corrupt in our country. <laughs> people just have a hard time wrapping their minds around this because we don't want to believe that the people we trusted have lied to us. Well, they've all lied to you, either institutional lie to protect the brand. We've got to protect Harvard or we got to protect GE, or we got to protect MSNBC, or we got to protect Fox, or we got to protect Gucci, or we got to protect Armani, or we got to protect NFL, or we got to protect NBA, or we got to protect the Yankees. We're a culture that can identify brands because we live through them and support them. And the leading people for a given per period of time, whether it's two years or 10 years, sometimes 20 years, whoever is the person or persons that are the spokesperson for the brand, we associate with them. It's wonderful when Michael Jordan tells you what kind of underwear to wear. Now think about that for a moment. Just, just stop and think about that for a moment. The man's worth a quarter billion dollars and partly because of his sponsorship uh, and, and endorsements like Tiger Woods. All right, Tiger Woods tells you what kind of car to drive. How would he know? He's a golfer. And right now, he's not in the top 1,000 good golfers. Why would you buy Michael Jordan's, whatever it is, I don't know, Fruit of the Loom underwear? But we do. Why? It's just stupid. <clears throat> it's absolutely stupid. So anyhow, at the end of all this, we are faced with this dilemma. What if the quality of the choices that we have trusted from other people end up being the quality of the choices uh, that cause our disease. So what do we do about it? Okay, here's what we do. This is the latest study. And um, by the way, the reason we have the dead zone is because we are not thinking. Can't blame it just on the pig manure or the artificial fertilizer or the farmers willing to do it without thoughts of what they're doing to their land or the water or your land or your Gulf of Mexico or the diseases that come from those polluted water wells. You can't blame just Tyson Food or the other food makers. You can't blame the slaughterhouses. You can't blame the industrial farmers who are raising these gentle, sentient, and intelligent animals for consumption. At the end of everything, you're to blame. You personally are to blame because you still have free will unless you're incapable of intelligent, independent thinking. Now, a lot of people are that stupid. They are simply... I call it intentional stupidity. They intentionally are neglectful. They don't want to learn something because they don't want to change something. If you learn something, then you have this dilemma. I know the truth. I'm not willing to act on it. Now I feel guilty. I feel shame. So you self-shame yourself, and that only further inspires you into this downward spiral of self-destructive behavior or anger. What a person's not willing to change themselves, they despise other people. So you kind of walk around with this self-righteous indignation that don't tell me what to do. But friend, what you're not doing is causing you to be sick. That's my business. You are correct. That is your business. Now, when you get sick, who's going to pay for that? I'm going to help. We're all going to have to help pay for your stupidity. Is that right? If you're the only one who suffers from your mistakes, go for it. Your choice. But if we're all having to collectively pay for everyone else's mistake, then we all should have at least some say into identifying the obvious risk factors and say, in the end, it's your life. But just remember, don't blame others when that day comes, when karma comes up and kicks you right square in the ass, and you say, I'm a victim. Yes, look in the mirror, friend. Look in the mirror. Now, who's looking back at you? Who said you got to eat that McDonald's? Who said you had to shop at Walmart? Who said you had to drink the Bud? Who said that you had to eat the sugar? Who said that you had to have the pizza? Who said that you had to veg out in front of a computer and watch porn? Who said that you, you had to vote for Clinton? Who said you had to vote for uh, Trump? Who said that you had... And suddenly you start realizing, gee whiz, maybe I am responsible for some of the choices in my life. Or like a lot of people say, I'm responsible for nothing that ever happens to me. The world is at fault. In which case then, you have a lot of company. So I hope we got this idea of why we really have a world gone absolutely down the toilet right now. Oh, and by the way, it is a, 
it's an absolute human tragedy when anyone is killed in any situation. Well, in this, this attack in uh, Spain, it was a tragedy. And there's lessons to be learned from that. At the very same time, there were a thousand people, 400 confirmed uh, dead, and 600 missing and presumed dead, because now they're in a recovery mode. They're not searching for any living beings. In one of the worst mudslide flash flood disasters in Sierra Leone's history. So let me get this right, just so we keep it in proper context and perspective. 13 lives and probably more dead in one country, and it's worldwide news everywhere because it's terrorists. 1,000 dead human beings, not a single reporting on it in the major media outside of a little flashpoint. But in no discussion, no comments of how is it that in Freetown you had a thousand people drowned or die in mudslides. How did that happen? Because they were poor. That's how it happened. And they were living in shanty towns. None of the rich died, none of the wealthy, none of the people could afford to live in safer places, but the poor. What does that tell us about how the poor are treated? And especially if they're poor blacks. And especially if they're poor blacks in Africa. What would happen, do you think? And this is just a hypothetical if a thousand wealthy white men, women, and children all died in a flash flood in Greenwich, Connecticut, or somehow there was a freak accident of nature and there was an electrical storm that electrocuted a thousand people in the wealthiest part of Fifth Avenue, or Park Avenue, including the billionaires band with the Koch brothers and uh, Stephen Schwartzman and others, what, what would be the outcome. Do you think it will get no news or do you think it would be all the media would be talking about for the next uh, six, six weeks? I consider this racist. I consider the valuing of one type of life above another. And I think that is just something we should focus a little bit of attention on. That said, now I want to share, in a few minutes I'm going to share something on Alzheimer's. But I want to share something that concerns me. Here is a latest article, and this is from um, uh, Fierce Healthcare, and it's about a major reversal. Study finds 56% of physicians now support single-payer healthcare system. That's terrific. This, the survey of these physicians show the vast majority, 56%, want single-payer. That's terrific. Now, I believe that Democrats and Republicans both should join together and mandate a universal health care instead of the stupidity and the corruption of Obamacare or the absolute insanity of anything Trump would try to do with the Republicans. Why? It's in the numbers. First and foremost, that we have had no health care that is focused upon prevention of disease. Isn't it wise to prevent a disease so you no longer have to have the person suffer personally and their family and possibly go bankrupt paying for it? For 20 years, the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States were medical bills. Since 2007-8, it's now uh, loss of your finances and home, uh, your mortgage capacity being underwater or losing your home. But right behind that in number two place is still medical expenses. So how can we have no medical expenses? How can we stop all this suffering, both fiscal, we can prevent disease? Every day there should be a channel set up, a nonprofit channel that does nothing except broadcast at least for 12 hours a day or longer, different informative programs on preventing disease. And then that make this available for people to download um, on television or on their computers. We should start putting programs in every school in the United States on the prevention of disease, and it must be mandatory that every student take a program in prevention of disease from first grade right through college graduation. We could reduce the suffering by at least 50 percent. That's how we start. Then with universal health care, we look at what we're spending right now on medical errors, 
the late, and these are all the official statistics because it, you've got to have the scholarship to be right in the numbers, 19.5 billion. So let's just add, add a few of these things up right now. And if you're at a computer, let's just round that off and say 19 billion, all right? So we can 19 billion on, uh, that we're paying on medical errors. Now, why do we have medical errors? Because we're not taking the time to have quality time with the patient and the physician. It's too mechanistic. You get a bunch of tests whether you need them or not. You get excessive tests because of defensive medicine. So if you had more time where the patient could talk with the doctor and the doctor had to look at all modalities, including diet, exercise, stress management, Ayurvedic, homeopathy, as well as what works within orthodoxy, you wouldn't have these medical errors. This is from the Journal of Healthcare Finance. Uh, that, that particular statistic. We also had one, one billion four hundred million dollars in increased mortality rates. Uh, we had one billion two hundred, uh, one billion two hundred million dollars, or ten million lost days on work productivity. Medical frauds one hundred and forty. So let's add one hundred and forty into our nineteen. We're at one hundred and fifty nine billion dollars. And in the National Review, the government spent $574 million to recover $9.3 billion in federal civil health care fraud. So we got $9 billion in health care fraud. And again, when you have a for-profit, and, and where was that from? Insurance uh, profits. Um, then we have United Health. It gave its CEO, or it, it, uh, uh, it made $46 billion. And uh, one company, $46 billion, that's all that we, the American people, are paying. And they pay doctors on their staff full-time to figure out ways of not allowing medical procedures. And they're paid bonuses for how much they keep us from being able to get in the way of medical services that saves the insurance companies. For that one company, they gave its CEO $20 million in compensation. Aetna's CEO got $27 million in compensation. In fact, Americans pay 40% more for Obamacare on average, and for every $100 spent in 2015, right now it's $140. In the United States, 25% of all health spital spending goes to administrative costs. That's the lowest figure I could find. It's more likely to be 30%. So let's just add in $1 trillion, $100 million, all right, to our figure. Why? Because that's how much... Um, we waste in administration expenses that we wouldn't need. We wouldn't need any insurance companies. We wouldn't need any of these thousands of administrators and these uh, uh, bureaucrats because you just walk into an office, you would have a card, you would have automatic acceptance, you could get any medical procedure, you walk right out, and you don't have to pay a penny. That's the way it should be, and it could be. We also have, um, we are double the global average when it comes to health care. Uh, we wasted, just in wasted paperwork, according to the latest report, $275 billion in a year. That's just in wasted paperwork. Uh, billing services were $471 billion. That's just in billing. Uh, we, we also had $70 billion to physicians, $74 billion to hospitals, $94 billion to health care and supplies, $198 billion to private insurers, $35 billion to public insurers, and this is uh, medical liability insurance, which is $55 billion. None of this do we need. We had drug costs, ready for this, $375 billion in a year. And in fact, the government spends $1,000 per year per person on drugs. Now, we, and that's going to grow this year to about, or in the next three years, to $600 billion a year that the drug companies are extracting from this. Why? Because they lobbied through a man named Dick Armey, who was a member of Congress, went from there over to the drug company lobbying, and while, while, while he was in Congress, he managed to get in the Medicare uh, Part B in the middle of the night. It was voted like 2 or 3 in the morning, a thing that says the government cannot, no, none of these government agencies can negotiate to lower the price of these Medicare drugs. So they can charge you $10,000 a pill, the government has to pay for it. 
Now, I got a list of the top 10 sold drugs in the United States, and this was unique, and I put this in my film, uh, The War on Health. Here's what it was. The actual cost, the generic 30-day cost of a drug versus the retail, what you pay. And we found that the cheapest profit they made was 3,000%. The most was 500,000% profit above the actual 30-day generic cost. So let's say a, a 30-day supply cost them 12 cents, 12 pennies, 12 pennies, and they charge us $300 per month supply. Think of the margin of profit they're making and not a single voice of complaint, not a reg registered complaint. You've got to stop the drug companies that are so corrupt and so deadly from exploiting this. And if you had universal health care, you could. And you could go back and change the Medicare Act and rewrite that. Also, we're spending $200 billion a year in unnecessary medical testing. Why? Because doctors don't want to be uh, sued. That's in 2017. How much was that in 2011? $6.8 billion. So <clears throat> how much? So look at it this way. Add up the following numbers. I'm just going to throw them at you. Add up uh, $200 billion, $300 billion. Now you're $500 billion. Add in another $55 billion. All right, so you're $355 billion. Add in $1 trillion, $100 billion. Now you're almost at two almost at two trillion dollars then add in for the hospitals we should have only un non-profit hospitals take the profit out of them so you don't have to be charged a hundred dollars for a one dollar bag of saline and so you got rid of the administration you got rid of the non-profit now how can you help the doctors then the other half of that is you give all doctors and nurses free education not a penny do they have to lay out to go right through medical school also there's no loans there's no debts you give them a guaranteed income of 250000 a year. That's more than enough. And with no debt and a guaranteed income, they're not going to then be giving you tests that you don't need, and you give them also, they can't be sued, you give them no-fault medical insurance, where a pool is put together to pay legitimate uh, grievances and errors and, and damage. Uh, so it doesn't cost the doctors. They're not going to do unnecessary tests, unnecessary medication. You take the profit out and suddenly you're saving $2 trillion a year. That means that our entire entire medical complex for universal care costs about a trillion, $100 million a year, and that means we've just saved $2 trillion. All right? I have, I have far more details than that, but that's enough to get you to realize. And lastly, before we go to our guests, I'm going to deal. I'm, I'm going to give you my commentary on my next show on Alzheimer's disease in depth. Classroom on the air. Take me about 20 minutes. I'm watching what's going on right now with this whole campaign between groups saying tear down this monument and no, don't tear down our monuments. What we should do is pause for a moment because we're not paying attention to the hundreds of important issues like global warming. We're not doing anything about it. Or feeding 18 million hungry children. Or stopping the pollution of our oceans. Or stopping intervention in other countries. Or stopping the police from being militarized and killing and arresting innocent people. Or asset forfeiture. Or all the other things that are wrong with us that are really important and need unified attention starting at the local level. But it's still completely legitimate to say if this monument is a monument that honors that which can be shown to represent the worst of human nature or that which debased or exploited or was prejudiced or biased in its view against any culture, Native American, African American, Latino, Jew, whoever it's against, then it should not be respected. However, let us be very careful to do it intelligently. For example, I believe that we should put a moratorium for the moment, even though it may make people feel good to go out and tear down a statue. <clears throat> if you're going to do that, don't be hypocritical. You've got to then tear down all the statues, not just by Robert E. Lee and or Stonewall Jackson or Jefferson Davis, the head of the Confederacy but rather everything else that was built based upon slave labor. 
which means in Europe, everything Queen Victoria built, from Buckingham Palace, you got to tear it down. And all the, and Parliament, you got to tear it down. That was for slave indentured labor. In the United States, the U.S. Capitol building, I don't believe they should be torn down. I think that's stupid. What I believe they should be is completely vacated and then have a actual virtual tour. So you put on headsets, and when you go in, it will give you a virtual tour, meaning you can go through these empty buildings, and it will tell you who built them, what they were for, what, what uh, like, for example, it was Parliament, how different prime ministers and Queen Victoria, the longest-running uh, monarchy at that time, now it's uh, Queen Elizabeth, but how they, you know, how they took over and controlled the opium wars in China, how they took over India, and the Bengal uh, starvation plague, Winston Churchill was responsible for that, and show you everything they did that was wrong in their whole history that that building represented the power from which they did it and the authority to do it. There should never be a human being allowed in any of these that works there, except maybe as a custodian. But you shouldn't tear them down. You should keep them as living monuments, just like Auschwitz. should never be torn down. Everybody should visit Auschwitz and Buchenwald and some of the other places, Tribeca, uh, Tribeca, so that you understand what went on there, how it happened, the suffering people had. Those are real uh, circumstance. We should do the same thing. For example, in, in 2012, Congress unveiled a historic marker that commemorated the slave labor that went into the construction of our capital. The area where the legislative center of the U.S. sits was previously known as Jenkins Hill, a heavily forested area that required extensive landscaping that was performed by slaves. And the, the sandstone in the old east front of the building contained the names of slave laborers who had cut the stone. So our capital was built with slave labor. Therefore, it also should be a point of contention. We should no longer allow the, any legislator in there. It should be as a monument to slavery and oppression because think of all the things that have happened. You should also have a virtual tour. You go through the Capitol, and, and with it, you can have the names of this, the, all these legislators, and you see it all. With virtual, you can put anything up. And you go into a room, say, this is the chamber. Here are some of the things. This is where the Spanish-American War. This is where 85 different nations' uh, 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 democratic elections were undermined. This is where the Gulf of Tonkin uh, legislation was passed that allowed us to officially be in uh, the Vietnam War that killed 5 million people and 58,000 Americans. This is where they voted, these idiots uh, and low-life degenerates voted for the, including Hillary Clinton, voted for uh, the weapons of mass destruction and destroyed Iraq and started uh, the whole basis of ISIS and all of these other terrorists. This is where, uh, this is where Ronald Reagan's uh, people met and uh, formulated the uh, Mujahideen being financed. So imagine if you got to go through a, a place that no longer has the fetid smell of that human refuge called legislators and instead you got an honest history of what that building created. My God, this would be like a museum of horror. And that's our capital. But then don't forget the White House. That would be whole. Okay? Including the, the racists who were there like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Now, go down to Wall Street. Go down to the Trinity Church. They should close the Trinity Church. Why? Because the very name Wall Street, where do you think it was born? That was born to slavery when enslaved Africans built a wall in 1653 to protect Dutch settlers from Indian raids. And there was a slave market at Wall and Water Street, and slave ships would dock at what is now South Street Seaport. Enslaved and free Africans were largely responsible for the construction of the early city. That meant they had to clear the land. They built a forts and mills and bridges and stone houses, the first city hall, the docks, the city prison, the Dutch and English churches, the city hospital, and uh, uh, France's uh, tavern, and at the corner of Wall Street and Broadway, they erected Trinity Church. So if Trinity Church was built by slave labor, it should never be a sacred place again. Shame on these people for not knowing their history. Build another church. Or do you really need a church to believe in something? But also, don't be hypocritical. Certain railroads you shouldn't go on because they were built strictly with slave labor. Uh, in fact, Nearly every rail line built east of the Mississippi River and south of the Mason-Dixon line before the Civil War was constructed or run at least partly by slaves. 
all four major railroads, and the, the North American, the Norfolk Southern, the CXS, and Union Pacific and Canadian National own lines that were built and operated with labor of enslaved black people. And then you got, you got Monticello. And during the construction of Thomas Jefferson's Virginia estate, slaves assisted the local laborers who built the sprawling estate. Beautiful estate, but it was built with slave labor. So it should, it, it should be shown that. You should show the whole history of how this man was, without question, the smartest president in American history. And yet, he had a very dark side to his nature. He was a sadist. Man was mean to the bone. Smart and mean. Bad combination. And he never even gave uh, freedom to his own mistress. Well, John, and if you go there now, just remember, slave carpenters built that. And John Hemings, who trained under white workers and was considered more than a standard assistant, crafted the fine mahogany furniture and served as a carpenter and cabinet maker beside James Dingsmore, the Irish, very famous Irish joiner, credited with Monticello's elegant woodwork. And then go to the Castillo de San Marcos, the oldest masonry fort in the continental U.S., and a na national monument that was con controlled by four different governments throughout the century, Spain, Great Britain, the Confederacy, and the United States. Slaves built that. And then the several buildings, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, one of the nation's oldest public universities, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, has a long history of slave labor. You should not allow any student, any teacher, to be in any building that was built by slave labor. And then Mount Vernon. I'm not a fan of George Washington. I think he was a megalomaniac, narcissistic uh, person. He was bright, but he was ruthless. He was the largest landowner at one point in the United States. It's wonderful what we can do when we want to sanitize someone's reputation. His home and plantation of the nation's first president ran on the labor of hundreds of slaves owned by Washington, George, and Martha, and many of whom specialized in different trades, including woodworking and blacksmithing. So, and I don't have time today to get into Lincoln, but if you think the Civil War was fought over freeing the blacks in the South, then you have missed a lot of the real story and Lincoln's actual views on blacks. And therefore, we should no longer consider motivated and, in spirit, and, and, and the spirit of, of uniqueness of the four faces on Mount Rushmore, Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Washington Jefferson, because they were all racist. And uh, I, I do not believe it should be torn down, but there should be a virtual tour there where you can go in and see the true history of their writings, the true documents. And so then when you look up, you know more about the person. And you should have that in each one of the places I mentioned. The real truth in virtual tours, just an idea, something to think about. <clears throat> now, I'm going to ask our stations along the way. I'm going to go a little over today because we have a guest on the line. I'm sorry I've taken so long, but I thought I just had to say this. And if we don't get it all in right now, we'll come back to him. Dr. Lynn Sapoto, ASAPUTO, board certified physician in internal medicine, and, um, and the website is drsaputo.com, was on last week, and we didn't have enough time to talk about light therapy, what is called photobiomodulation for treating disease. But he's here now, and we'll take him up and uh, try to get as much in as we can. Nice to have you with us, Lynn. Hey, Gary, thank you. I've been intrigued by your conversation. I've been listening for a while. Uh, I think you really have a handle on what's going on in this country. And, and unless we evolve to a higher level of consciousness, we've got nowhere to go. And I think the average person has no hope for really thinking they can make a difference themselves. And I think what it might boil down to is that each per it actually depends on each person. And it begins with each individual to try and make the changes that we have to have to get away from this thing we have across all of our aspects of our culture. Our business versus service is just outrageous, and you document it so well. I want to thank you for making that presentation. I just don't think that at this time in life, with those of us who are concerned about creating everything from a spiritual perspective, that we should accept the fact that someone was a brilliant intellect, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, which he substantially copied. He was not the first to write 
the words that he wrote. Go back and do the history in England and you'll see exactly who wrote it before him. But he was still nonetheless a brilliant man. It, didn't, it does not in any way appease my notion of Jefferson or any of these other, you know, 70% of all the signers' Declaration of Independence own slaves. That yeah. should not be a forgiven purpose when they signed a declaration knowing it was wrong. All men are created equal. No, Native Americans weren't, women weren't, blacks right. weren't, and others weren't. So they lived on lies, and I believe we should just call these lies out today, but do it in a way that is not destructive but informative. Totally right. I think that the, the understanding is the first thing, and then the grassroots level is where I think change has to occur. We, and that's the only way we're going to do it. I mean, our Congress is totally corrupt. Uh, the way we run business is corrupt. Religion is corrupt. Everything is corrupt. And it's because we got this battle of greed versus sharing and giving and loving. So until we evolve, we've got no chance. And it has to start with each individual. So I, I, I just thank you again for pointing that out and putting it back on the individual. Because we can't just complain about the government and all the things that it's doing. We've got to come up with some answers. And the answers are going to come from each individual evolving, evolving to a place where they want to give rather than take. It's not the narcissism. It's the loving and giving and the sharing. Well, it's, and I would add the, the quality of information. That's why I believe we shouldn't tear down these monuments, but rather mm -hmm. we should have a virtual tour where you, like you're in a museum and you want to know about the history of something, you put on the headsets and you can hear everything about it. If we understood the truth, the real truth behind yeah. any monument, including Mount Rushmore, then yeah. we would, we don't have to tear it down. We can see it and see it for what it is. And then that can correct a lot of our maladaptive historical notions. In any case, what I want to do now, would you please tell us your research, because it's original, it's funded by the government, you're doing some outstanding work uh, on the notion of photobiomodulation, of treating disease. Tell us, please, in the overview, what that is. What we're looking at is how light affects the biochemistry and physiology of the body. You know, you, you start talking about another system that's radically different from the, what we learn in medical school. You know, we're into biochemistry and physiology, and it's all in that area. But when you think about light and, and the fact that the world couldn't exist without the sun, and it, puts, it makes everything work, it's naive to think that you could just leave that out of the equation and not pay attention to it. And for the last 40 years, people have actually been studying this in some wonderful places. Great work out of Harvard and Boston University, out of Germany. Uh, out of a lot of places, there are thousands now of articles that are talking about how light, and, and really almost any kind of light, it could be infrared, it could be blue, it could be red, and the difference in those lights is penetration. How deep do they go? The infrared goes up to 10 inches deep, the blue goes into it about a millimeter. So what we're looking at is what do these different kinds of light do? How do they affect the biochemistry and the physiology of the body? So when you look at, at, at the specific things it does, first of all, as soon as light hits a blood vessel that's constricted, it causes the instant release of nitric oxide, which is a chemical that causes instant vasodilatation. So if somebody had angina, say they got constriction of their coronary arteries, and you shine the light, and I've done this on many patients, over their chest into the heart, Within seconds, you see an increase in circulation, the pain is gone, uh, and, and, they're, and, they're, and you're fixing the problem that was there, at least temporarily. But it doesn't just do that. It, it, it attracts activated stem cells, so that all healing requires stem cells. And it makes those stem cells activate, and it brings them into the area wherever damage is. So you can speed up healing, according to the data from NASA, by about 40%. We know that it stimulates the production of collagen, which you need for most uh, tissue repair when you're looking at orthopedic problems. But possibly the biggest thing that it does is it increases the production of energy. You know, gasoline runs a car, but ATP runs your body. And ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is largely made by the energy packets in, in human cells that uh, convert what you eat into ATP energy. And when you shine the light, this infrared light that goes deep into the body, uh, into these cells, what happens is you stimulate the production of up to 50% more ATP, particularly if you're talking about a cell that's damaged 
that's not able to do its normal function. So what we see is that the areas around a stroke or a heart attack or some kind of uh, sports injury or God knows what that's, that's caused the death of some cells has an area around it, it always does, that's called the perinfarction area. And these cells are in shock. They don't function their normal metabolism as you would hope they would. Uh, but what, that, what, what you can do when you shine the light on them is speed up the production of ATP. You can attract those stem cells. You can increase circulation. And all of a sudden, you've got return and function. So it's, it's wonderful to see people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries uh, and heart attacks and strokes able now to make some recovery that we, they couldn't do before. The light also reduces inflammation. If you've got an inflamed area, it reduces inflammation. So you take care of the, the swelling uh, and, the uh, and the inflammation and you heal the wounds, even the deep tissues and nerves by shining just this light over the area. Uh, it also, one of the great things it does is relieve pain. So if you've got somebody with a cervical disc and, and pain is going into their hands, or somebody with a sciatica because of a disc in the low back, or a traumatic injury, they got a hematoma, or a muscle pull, like a football player gets a, a, a hamstring pull. You can do a lot to, re, to reverse all this pain, and that happens in seconds. I mean, it's, it's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, Gary. So for me, it's been shocking to see what you can do uh, when you are getting into this whole business of light therapy. So real quick, because we're out of time, okay. can any, any doctor use this, any nurse use this? Where do the people get this? Uh, you, there are devices all over the country that are made. There are probably 10 or 15 different manufacturers. I use the, the Maurice Bales, who's been my friend for 17 years that I've been in this. And I would, I would if, if you're interested in getting the best devices, if you want to email me out I, and you can use the the doctor, Dr. Len at drsavuta.com, I'd be happy to give that information out to individuals who want to know. Uh, it's, there aren't good courses, and, and it's, so there's not a lot of training available. There's not reimbursement for services, so the FDA has literally turned off uh, the ability for most doctors to be able to afford to give this treatment. So How much does the machine cost a doctor? It's the same old thing, yeah. Oh, the, what's no, the cost how much, of the doctor? Uh, well, yeah. a, a good device. A good device is between two and seven thousand, I would say. That's and if you small want to get the imaging, for I, I think it's really important to have at when you're uh, when you're treating somebody in real time. You can get an infrared camera that will show you what your uh, heat patterns on the surface of the skin are uh, as you're as you're treating this person, and then next to it, you can show in real time what's happening. And that takes training. The problem is, is we don't have good training available. And most of the companies that make devices don't know what they're talking about. They give you schedules to do that are literally stupid. Okay. Well, at least you've opened our eyes to something that exists that can help. What I'll do is we'll let's share this with the audience. People can go to Dr. Saputo, S-A-P-U-T-O dot com, and we'll start there and get some more information. Thank you, Len, for being with us today. We'll have another conversation in the near future. Sounds good, Gary. Keep up the great work. Thank you. I'm Gary Nall. Thank you all for listening. Have a nice day, everyone.